Hi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for those who joined us. We've only got three people in the room alongside our panelists. I'll wait just one more minute, see if we can gather some more panelists. This topic's far too exciting for it to only attract three people. Um, hopefully word will spread soon. When we look at the illustrious uh, panel that we have in front of us, representing many of the countries across Asia and many industry experts. Fantastic. Great to see you again, Melissa. Welcome along. I'm just going to pause one minute before we start the discussions, uh, given we've got four people uh, in the audience and six people uh, on the panel. Okay, we're, we're now live. Um, I'm going to kick off uh, this discussion. Um, the discussion is being recorded, so maybe there will be a chance for others to, to join the recording of this. Um, so perhaps if we just go around and do introductions uh, of the panel first, uh, I'm going to go in the order that I see on my screen. So, uh, Bill, if you'd like to just say a couple of words about this. Uh, Bill Bonnet from, from the United States, uh, heavily involved in a broad portfolio of uh, Renewable uh, energy and, mitig and climate mitigation uh, NGOs uh, involved in coastal ecology, trees uh, do have a, a solar uh, solar energy in Africa uh, NGO, and also uh, a council here in the states on electrification. Uh, so involved in a number of different elements of the renewable puzzle. Thank you for, for joining us, Bill, uh, especially given the time of day. Okay, Sergey, uh, over to you. Yeah. Uh, hello, all. I am Sergey Deming. Uh, I am general manager of Rosatom uh, branch uh, in Japan, Tokyo now. Uh, historically, I have been uh, working in energy sector about 20 years. Uh, previously, I worked in oil and gas uh, industry, working mainly with British Petroleum and Shell uh, in Russian projects. And uh, last uh, seven years, I have been working uh, in uh, Russian state nuclear corporation Rosatom, previously in Beijing office and now in Tokyo. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you for joining us, Sergei. Big Sun, um, if I can move to, to you next. <coughs> Yes, thank you. Good morning and uh, good evening, maybe for some others. <laughs> my name is Iksan. Uh, my background is about more than 16 years in renewable energy. But before, I used to work with Shell in Netherlands <coughs> so, and also moved also to energy audit for some companies in Germany and also Belgium. I returned to Indonesia 2010 and building some uh, projects for renewable energy, more than uh, 200 projects already uh, completed in Indonesia, uh, constructions and uh, running now. Thank you. Thank you, Iksan. Matthew, uh, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Murti Nuni. Uh, I'm from uh, Marshall Funds. Uh, we are an uh, investor in those uh, sustainable energy projects, so, uh, sustainable investments. We have private equity and public market business as well. Uh, we, mm -hmm. we, we also have a renewable energy investment business, uh, particularly into Asia. Uh, and uh, we have a company called Marshall Global Renewable Power, which is uh, investing primarily in uh, wind and solar projects uh, in Vietnam. So we, we, at the moment, we are very excited about investing into Vietnam into uh, renewable energy projects. Because it's a new market for renewable energy, a, a market which requires uh, uh, the new generation of power with high electricity demand growth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And and Dr. Ruth, if uh, we'd like to hear from from you over in the Philippines. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, whatever. I am Ruth Bibriones. I was a former government. Philippine government of Israel, and I have uh, almost eight Wait, years. I was NHK with Asian Development. I was uh, an, an consultant of Asian Development Bank, 
United Nations and USID. So uh, it's more ta- more on I'm more on sustainable energy, environment, and energy. Um, lately, for the last ten years, I was involved in development of renewable energies, particularly biomass, solar, wind, and hydro. And it's in the Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Nepal. So that's where that's really my background. Glad to be here. Thank you very much, Ruth. So I'm Neil Bertens. I'm your chair for today. Um, I'm running a consultancy out in Singapore called The Next 90 Days. We're a global uh, outfit. And I just like to kick off the panel discussion uh, by understanding why it is that renewable energy is a topic that should be attracting uh, more than six people into this room and why uh, as CEOs uh, across Asia, we should perhaps be paying a lot of attention to this. So, uh, Bill, if I can start with you, I'd just be interested as we move uh, to a new U.S. president, how you see renewable energy hitting the agenda uh, globally and in the USA specifically. Uh, thanks, Neil. I uh, I think it's fair to say we're in the in the sustainability and renewable community. We're where I would term cautiously optimistic. Uh, the pace of change will likely it somewhat depend on two special elections upcoming in the state of Georgia, which will determine whether the Senate will be in uh, Democrat controlled or Republican controlled. I, I, that will make a difference on the margin I, margins. I don't think it will make a difference on the trajectory of efforts um, in the next in the next four years and presumably in the next ten years. I think there's a societal consensus that that uh, that will probably reach sixty to seventy percent approval rate. That we need to accelerate the pace of change on renewables and sustainables uh, to meet our our Paris. 2030 goals. Uh, or we've seen some significant progress on the power side with solar and wind that is displacing coal rather uh, rather steadily. I I am of the mind that, that the, one of the biggest challenges is more rapid uh, electrification of the transport fleet. I think we're behind. Uh, we're certainly behind China. Uh, behind other countries, we need to, uh, by and large, uh, you know, as you know, the technology is there. It's it's becoming more commercial every day. We need to do smart a smart ramp up of uh, <clears throat> electrifying the fleet as quickly as possible. So, and I think the Biden administration is very much committed to that. And I think we can we can. Having the U.S. and its innovation engine back under the climate umbrella, I think, is a good thing for for us and for the world. Thank you very much, Bill. So um, if I can come to you next, Ruth, you've been looking at policy across um, Asia, and I'd be very interested how you see the need for renewable energy being so important in Asia specifically uh, and not just some of the already large established economies. Uh, yes, uh, Neil, uh, what I can say is that there, there is already an energy direction direction and energy transformation in connection with uh, policy support initiatives. You know, you know, doing renewable or clean energy is not just technology, it's more on policy framework uh, uh, initiatives. So the region uh, globally must, must uh, also transform or there must also be a shift towards uh, preparation of policy framework towards clean energy. And, uh, you know, uh, we all know that um, there's a lot of policy support initiative when it comes to, uh, that's only in Asia, but also around the world. And uh, it's now, and there are so many uh, uh, policy that is, uh, we call it reinforcement of stimulus. And uh, also moving towards momentum to address climate change. So, the direction is energy transformation, and that should be supported by framework and policy. And governments must uh, must join hands. And uh, uh, knowingly now, um, post pandemic, most countries are going towards uh, transformation to clean energy, and the government are also uh, preparing for 
to policy shift policy policy shift towards a uh, um, a new framework so yeah if we are going to move forward the uh, policy transformation uh there must be a a, a lot it's not um, um so much shift or say so much transformation but it must go on hand in hand with economic direction technology so it should be are we going towards low carbon economy that will support post pandemic initiatives or say talking about clean energy it's not only powering the grid it must also powering your your uh, your your transmission line generation distribution as also in your on your on the road trans transportation so what are the clean energy technology that would support the clean energy policy initiative so every technology innovation must be supported by policy initiative also with technologies well, uh, thank you, thank you. so we heard from bill about uh, the transportation side there as well so we will return to that topic what i'd like to do is start by looking at solutions for large cities and then we'll move on to solutions we've got uh, strength uh, in both of those so just uh Murthy, if if i can start with you um can you describe the types of solutions you think that are going to be most relevant for large cities and i think you've got some examples of of what's being done as well as what can be done in the future um, so uh, in, in large cities uh, uh, the main source of uh, pollution uh, and uh, uh emissions is uh, is the transportation sector so that that is something which needs to re reform uh very quickly uh at, at the moment uh, large, large, many of the big cities uh, like uh, new delhi or beijing are choked with uh, in, in, in the, uh the, with the pollution uh and uh, uh, at, at the moment uh, uh you know covid along with pollution is creating massive problems in uh, uh, in cities like New Delhi, so um, electrification of transportation is is a big issue. Uh, in the past, about uh, 15, 20 years ago, uh, New Delhi addressed this problem with uh, LNG conversion of uh, all uh, uh, public transportation vehicles into LNG. So overnight, uh, Supreme Court decided that uh, uh, all trans public transportation will be through LNG, and the, that uh, reduced inflation. Uh, significantly uh, in the short term, but again, uh, uh, transportation vehicles uh, multiplied uh, with uh, with the growth in the economy and growth in the city of New Delhi. And uh, uh, again, we are having huge uh, pollution problems, uh, and that, that is also uh, exacerbated by the uh, farmers who are burning uh, their produce. Uh, so uh, the the next stage of uh, trying to reduce pollution is. Uh, through electrification, and, uh, and in India, the government has already uh, made a proposal that uh, uh, by 2030, all all new, all new passenger vehicles will be uh, electrified. Uh, but that uh, that is a tall order. It's a, it's it's a huge task. Uh, you, you need the uh, electrification points. Uh, uh, so uh, like just like filling stations. Okay. So, sorry, so, okay. we're we're hearing you speak over. Mercy here. So, ah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, electrification of big cities, so the transportation is uh, a, a big task which uh, the cities need, need, need to take care of. And, and, ho and hopefully, that, uh, that, uh, the electricity will be produced through renewable energy. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. So, um, <laughs> Okay, I'm pleased that died down. <laughs> um, so I was just going to come to you, Sergey. Um, one of the solutions for large cities may potentially be hydrogen. Um, and I, I think Japan is quite far advanced relative to the rest of Asia and indeed the rest of the world on hydrogen. So I'd like to hear from you on hydrogen. Yeah, uh, thank you, Neil. Uh, yes, uh, Japan, I think, is the leader in the world now in developing hydrogen energy. Uh, 
Japan has outstanding strategy development uh, as EU countries as well. Uh, and as you know, we are mainly a nuclear corporation. Historically, Rosatom is nuclear corporation. And uh, we still believe that nuclear power generation doesn't depend on weather conditions. Uh, it has a very long life cycle. But uh, now we are also involved uh, in uh, hydrogen business as well. So we are just beginning it. Uh, and uh, we think that uh, really uh, nuclear and uh, hydrogen would be uh, the base uh, of uh, energy safety in the future. I am uh, very sorry for uh, wind and uh, solar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's good things. It can be also some uh, supportive, uh, supportive uh, energy sources uh, for small villages, uh, for uh, private households, etc., etc. But to tell you the truth, I don't believe personally that. Uh, wind and solar uh, would be uh, some uh, energy sources of uh, stable energy sources in the future. Uh, but hydrogen uh, is the uh, strategic pathway uh, for sure. And I think that everybody should pay uh, more attention uh, to hydrogen technologies development as Japan and the uh, EU is doing. Thank you very much. So I'd like to come to Iksan next, because the, obviously there are times where hydrogen is, is not the solution. And indeed, if we look at some rural parts of, of Asia, then actually the, even the Internet is, is not available. So Iksan, I think you've, you're a very passionate champion in this area. So I'd love to hear from you. on. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Um, from, my com oh, I, from where I come from in Indonesia, that the uh, challenge um, is about the rural electrifications. So when we talk about rural electrifications, we cannot introduce uh, nuclear or other uh, power plant, big power plant, because it should be decentralized. And uh, I do agree with Sergey that uh, like uh, Indonesia has uh, so much biomass that we can develop for the uh, source of the power plants, that we can work together with a local community to supply the electricity, they can do the farming for the uh, biomass crops and then also for the waste of the agriculture can be used for the res uh, source of the uh, electrifications. And I also work with the uh, one of uh, projects with the uh, Ministry of Inform uh, Communications and Information that the challenge with the rural, uh, not only electrifications, but also the internet. And as you are also aware of that nowadays, uh, especially during the pandemic, it's always a challenge that if you don't have uh, internet at all. In Indonesia, we have more than uh, 13,000 uh, uh, locations, uh, villages, that they don't have uh, internet access yet. And we have about 3,000 uh, villages that we don't have uh, electrifications. So in combined, that's, a, that's also that what I do now that we try to connect between the Ministry of Communications and uh, Informatics to be able to make uh, a kind of regulations uh, cooperate together with the Ministry of Energy because this planning sometimes not match each other and then should be combined. Um, so that's what I do now. Great. We're going to pause for some questions shortly. So for those of you who've joined us, uh, please start to get those ready. Uh, I'd like to come back to you, Ruth, um, and just add some more comments on this topic of how we cope um, with trying to get renewable energy out to those who perhaps don't have any form of electricity right now and, and perhaps don't even have uh, internet connection, um, as we were hearing there from it. Well, uh, internet connection is... Uh, the government accepted that, admitted also that we are not much uh, up to date when it comes to, to internet um, technology. Although we're trying our best to to install uh, internet connection all over the Philippines, but looking at the the electricity sector in the Philippines, there's still 11 million uh, 
um, areas, 11 million people not uh, being reached by electricity. So, so that uh, the direction now is to reach, we call it the project reaching the last mile in electricity, uh, in rural electrification. So we are moving towards uh, adopting technologies that would uh, create a uh, um, standalone uh, facility or say the, the technology on the microgrids. And uh, with, with that uh, in mind, um, the government has drawn up plans and programs to, to install a hybrid solar biomass project and removing the genset powered by uh, by we call that diesel uh, power plant, small power plant. So um, reaching 11 million people in the Philippines is uh, has been uh, is put in hold because of the issue of pandemic that happened. But however, in the cities, uh, we are also going towards energy efficiency when it comes to powering the industrial areas. Um, putting up uh, or installed the uh, microgrids inside the the industrial areas, where in order that they they could power their own facility at the same time, uh, um, we call it the issue of we are em employing uh, energy storage in some facilities, so that so that when using a variable RE or say sun solar uh, solar or wind. When the sun is not shining, when the when the wind is there is no is, oh, is high speed uh, generation of electricity, there is a backup through battery storage system, uh, like what he, um, what that was that was stated a while ago about energy hydrogen energy or say uh, we have so much excess uh, power on solar and wind, so the only way is to also to store store the excess solar and wind. So there are many ways to store the excess solar and wind in order that could be used during nighttime when the sun is not shining and the wind is not, or there is no such uh, available wind to, to use. So uh, an available technology on the storage batteries is there. I always say there are a lot of technologies in the storage batteries at the same time. Uh, green, green hydrogen is also available, but that is a very complicated technology for now. It's very costly. So, but in the Philippines, we are also including all the cities uh, adopting a certain part of the transportation the cities and also the rural areas. We are moving towards uh, energy transformation and, and uh, transition. However, it is already backed up by strong policy framework. So thanks, Ruth. We had some background noise there. I apologize to everyone. I'm not sure what's causing that. I don't believe this is coming from our speakers. So um, we will note that to run the world, but it seems to have resolved itself. Right, great. So what I wanted to try and do is we have such an international sort of representation here. I just want to try and bring out some of the, the differences of stages that we've seen. And really this starts linking to how economic policy, political will has a real impact on the adoption of renewable energy. It's not just about the level of development. And Murti, I'd, I'd like to start with you and hear how you think um, you see the, the different uh, influences on whether a country is able to uh, adopt and embrace renewable energy. Thanks, Neil. Um, uh, so m most of the Asian countries, as you know, are high, uh, high growth, uh, still facing high economic growth compared to the European uh, countries or uh, USA. Uh, therefore, the new demand for electricity generation is coming from uh, growth. So first, the renewable energy projects uh, will have to cater to the growth and then uh, replacement of uh, the thermal power. Uh, so uh, at, at the moment, most of the Asian countries are under 10% uh, of renewable, uh, renewable energy generation, uh, excluding hydro. Uh, and uh, whereas uh, uh, countries like uh, Germany and uh, UK have already reached 25 to 30% of uh, uh, wind and solar energy, uh, we, which is uh, pretty much uh, difficult to cross beyond 25 to 30% because it's uh, variable energy. So it's available only when the sun shines or the wind blows. So, so uh, since storage uh, is uh, 
not yet available in large scale as yet. Um, so, uh, 25 to 30 percent of renewable energy generation uh, in that in the energy mix uh, is uh, possible at this point of time. Uh, uh, I'm talking about renewable energy as in wind and solar, uh, which is intermediate, intermediate energy. Uh, in in Asia, uh, if renewable energy will have to catch up with both uh, growth in electricity demand as well as uh, replacement. Uh, but in some of the countries like uh, Vietnam, where I'm presently located, uh, because uh, here this, this country is experiencing huge, uh, probably one of the highest electricity demand growth in the world uh, because of uh, relocation of manufacturing facilities and the uh, general growth in the economy. Uh, so we, uh, the, for over the last 10 years, they've experienced as much as 9 to 10% uh, electricity demand growth, which is, uh, which is perhaps one of the highest in the world. Uh, uh, compared to most of the European countries where electricity demand growth is pretty much flat, for instance, in the UK, the peak demand, peak electricity demand was seen in 2008. Uh, after that, it's uh, you've not seen, seen much more. Uh, the, the the reason for that is also energy efficiency. Well, most of the devices that you use today, uh, compared to ten years ago, twenty years ago, including your refrigerator, is a lot more efficient. So the, and yeah, and the, uh, energy efficiency measures in uh, new buildings, uh, new construction is also happening. So um, uh, there is not too much of an energy demand growth. So most of the renewable energy uh, developments in Europe is for replacement. Uh, but in, in Asia, the, uh, the renewable energy development is not able to catch up with uh, just only the growth. So, for for instance, in in in, in Vietnam itself, um, we're going to see uh, even with uh, uh, a lot of renewable energy capacity uh, development at, mo at the moment, uh, we'll, we're still going to see at least twenty to thirty gigawatt of uh, uh, fossil fuel capacity coming up in the next ten years. Uh, so there is there is a huge demand. There is uh, uh, you know a lot of investment which uh, foreign investors can come in and help out in some of these countries. Yeah, I think this is an important point, and I know from some of the audience that you know they're interested in investments like like yourself uh, with Marshall. So I th I think this is fascinating that there's a real opportunity in Asia, particularly in developing markets, to really grow the green agenda. Um, and the sources of renewable energy as the demand increases, um, it's slightly more difficult where you're trying to switch um, from a, an established uh, set of energies. And I, I wonder perhaps if we can return to Ixan and then we'll start coming to the questions from the audience. Because I think um, in Vietnam, we were hearing there that you know there's some real embrace, embracing and engagement with the development of, of renewable energy because new energy is needed and, and so it makes sense to, to, to invest in renewable energy. But I guess in um, Indonesia, we, we have some additional challenges uh, to, to getting renewable energy going, Exan. And this, this, this is Indonesia, but there are other examples across Asia. Be interested to, to hear some of the challenges that you see Indonesia. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Indonesia is for sure uh, is uh, one of the biggest market for renewable energy because we have uh, all this uh, resource for renewable energy from geothermal, uh, biomass, wind, uh, solar irradiance, and also including the nuclear source. And the challenge with Indonesia that we just uh, yesterday we have the uh, one of the biggest expo for renewable energy, and in that report is also mentioned that. Indonesia only cover about 10 gigawatt for renewable energy from uh, so it's about 9% of the total uh, energy that we use in Indonesia at this moment. So one of the challenge for this uh, is because of the uh, we have a, a long uh, queue of the uh, bidding also and then this bidding should be also approved by the local electricity state company and it's always the challenge when 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 the company itself also have the barrier for the paying the, the debt that we already know that we have a lot of debt for this. And now uh, our uh, electricity state company looking for a, a green bond and so on. And and currently, uh, the Indonesia, since it is still monopolized of the electricity, and we, don't, we could not uh, electrify uh, uh, our rural electrifications without the permissions of the permits from the uh, lo local uh, Indonesian state-owned electricity company. So 
it's a good way somehow, but uh, in another way that we uh, it also holds some investments. And because I know from Philippines and also from other countries, there are a lot of companies uh, would like to enter financial for investment for especially for rural applications. But uh, we need uh, a certain permits uh, to release from the uh, uh, state-owned electricity company because the owner of the permit is the state-owned electricity company. And at this moment, the current situations that we, uh, our state-owned electricity company, only focusing on the reducing the OPEX, which uh, which means that uh, do the hybrid for the systems, uh, reducing the. Uh, uh, coal uh, intake, uh, try to replace with biomass and so on. What I would like to see uh, more in the future that we will have more like Vietnam, for example, like Murti also experienced in Vietnam, that if you bring the investment and then we can do uh, our investments directly, you can have a, a short bidding or whatever, but it's not a long queue of biddings uh, because you you already have your own investment, you already have your locations, even you already finished your study. So somehow, for me, uh, it is still a challenge if we cannot build it. And then the demand is there. So that's, I think that's what I would like to say, Neil. Thank you very much indeed. So what I'd like to do, we've, we'd love to get on to transportation and a couple of other topics, but we do have some questions uh, from the audience, so we'll go with those. Uh, the first was a question around AI, and um, the the person posing that, Mia, uh, has a particular interest in this. So interested if anyone on the panel uh, can describe a little bit the role that they see linking AI and renewable energy. Shall I start with that? Because I already uh, working on that project. So if the the artificial intelligence uh, that also need power, and we also use artificial intelligence for uh, smart and or precision agriculture for applications. So I'm working now to develop the, and also do the fundraising for this type of project. But also that's the most important thing that uh, we can work in with any power uh, electrifications to support the AI, but uh, if since the AI only need a small part of the uh, electricity, so why we don't use the uh, renewable energy for, for this, especially for the smaller one? Because, uh, yeah, we try to save our resource. We try to uh, save the uh, power supply from the coal and also from the even from the nuclear. We can use a biomass. We can use a hydro. It's a small things because the AI doesn't need a, a lot of a big electrifications. Uh, that's what, what uh, from my. Thank you very much indeed. So, um, what I think we had a, also a question from Gregory, um, and this this was a topic we were going to cover anyway. I think Ruth, you and I talked about this: the development of renewables in terms of energy transition. Um, you can probably see the question here as well. The energy invested for energy return equation as well. So, uh, Ruth, uh, could we hear from you on this uh, question from Greg? Can't hear you. Ruth, uh, we still have you on mute. Sorry. Thank you for muting, but <laughs> we're ready for you to. I'm unmute. so sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. There are factors, or say, uh, three issues when it comes to energy transition. These include uh, policy, technology, commerciality, and uh, technology. So four. So when you talk about policy, it must also it must also conform with your technology and also financial aspect at the same time. Uh, technology, financial, technology, commercial, policy, and uh, of course is uh, the support of all global support. So this must conform. So energy transition. We have to look into the situation that each country has an uh, existing energy mix. Uh, in the Philippines, we have now 60% uh, uh, powered by coal, fossil fuel, whether it in, in the, on the energy sector or the state, and also on the, uh, the infrastructure sector. So, so moving, so that because of the 60% uh, adoption of, of coal or fossil fuel in the Philippines, we are uh, 
that is all to us Philippines has become most vulnerable one of the most vulnerable countries in the world as we come in pack of climate change so policy expert will say um, a lot of a lot of studies have been has already suggested that why can't we just re revise or revise the energy the energy mix so here comes energy transmission or say um energy shifting of the energy mix or say we have to revise so that is not moving towards local more economy or energy transition supported by policy by technology by financial because so if even if we have uh we are very good we have very good technology proven technologies solar wind biomass hydro 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 or, or geothermal but when there is no policy that supports as to incentives permitting process physical requirement technology infrastructure everything but when there is no such uh, backup from the government even if we have a very good technology proven but there is very high cost of technology like solar wind biomass geothermal then how could we move forward when coal is very cheap so and also at the same time the project is not viable so these factors should go hand in hand, regulatory, technology, financial. So, so moving towards energy transition, there must be, uh, we call that un unity, uh, combination of these three aspects. So how could account investors come in when the policy or the government infrastructure on, on, on uh, laws is not supportive of the technology or in the Philippines, we have only 40% for foreigners. So any investment, would, would, and any investor would look at look at it, not only second thoughts or what, because if I would fund 100% the the, uh, the the geothermal power, but I would own, own only 40%. So if that is not good, that is not very attractive. Even if, but in the solar, well, solar is very attractive because there's so much higher irrigation in the Philippines. Here comes again the 4060. And, uh, yeah, the grid is not ready. So we have to modernize the grid infrastructure. That's the thing. When we call about energy transformation or local bond economy, there are so many factors to consider. Yes, thank you. Th thank you, Ruth. And I think this is fantastic because what we're seeing here as we try and look at renewable energy across Asia there are so many factors influencing it, um, and there is not one single approach that will work. We're hearing the difference between small rural locations, large cities. We've heard a little bit about different solutions from hydrogen, solar, wind. Fantastic. Um, I'd like to come to, to Murti again. There's a question from Sean. Uh, I hope you've had a chance to see this, Murti. How do you contextualize renewable energy so that the capability is optimally, optimally supported throughout life. Thanks, Neil. Uh, uh, thanks, Sean, for the question. Uh, so uh, the renewable energy, uh, particularly wind and solar, is uh, pretty well established uh, at the moment. Uh, so it, it's, uh, uh, these are uh, mature technologies. Um, you have uh, efficiencies uh, of the generation uh, improving every year uh, and the uh, costs are reducing significantly uh, right now uh, the level is cost of energy of uh, solar is uh, perhaps the, the lowest among all uh, perhaps competing with uh, uh, thermal as well with with uh, fossil fuels uh, 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 but of course uh, it is intermittent so there is some additional cost attached to it uh, and that is perhaps uh, uh, important in terms of uh, supporting uh, through the la throughout the life of the uh, renewable energy production, uh, uh, because at some point uh, renewable energy will will get saturated in the grid uh, you, you, when you have sufficient amount of uh, uh, solar projects and wind projects in the system. Uh, when the when uh, during uh, very sunny days and and windy days, this ha happens in uh, Germany sometimes during the summer. Uh, you will have. Uh, renewable energy catering to the entire grid demand. And uh, because of uh, take or pay uh, policy, uh, uh, the thermal power gets sold at uh, negative prices. Uh, so 
uh, but uh, the, the, go the government is conscious about that. Uh, they have they have policies which support uh, renewable energy. Um, it's a uh, it's a little bit more difficult in countries like in the in India uh, or in future maybe Vietnam when it has more renewable energy. Uh, so uh, electricity departments find it difficult to absorb renewable energy power beyond a certain level uh, during the, the, these days. Uh, but they, they're addressing it by reinforcing the grid. So that is the most important thing. Uh, so uh, in, in India particularly, they already have uh, green corridors uh, to transport power from uh, excessive uh, green projects in certain locations in certain states where, uh, like for instance, uh, uh, seven states uh, in India uh, have uh, produced most of the renewable energy and uh, it becomes excessive uh, during certain, uh, certain times of the year. Uh, so that at that point of time, renewable energy needs to be transported to the generation centers, the, the consumption centers. So that is the key to the future of the use of renewable energy. Brilliant. Thank you. We have exactly two minutes left. I'd like to finish on this transportation question. Um, so, Sergey, you have 45 seconds, please, to tell us how hydrogen can actually be used as part of a transport solution. Uh, Neil, thank you. Uh, I, I haven't heard, unfortunately, your question uh, well. Could you repeat, please? Because yeah. there was no um, noises. Yes, apologies. I'm not sure it's causing the noise, but in hydrogen, um, you and I were discussing how it can actually be transported and, and therefore potentially could also uh, be used in many ways. And you were describing how uh, hydrogen is now a uh, percentage of of the Japanese cars as well. So we, I, I, I don't know how many percent, but there's definitely a few cars on the Japanese roads that are actually powered by hydrogen. Yeah, but uh, as, as for general transportation of, of uh, hydrogen, uh, now such transportation uh, technologies uh, are already in place. Uh, as uh, everybody, I think, know, Japanese company Kawasaki Heavy Industries has, has developed special ships uh, for transporting hydrogen and uh, the transportation has already begun this year. Uh, as for cars, uh, Japan uh, maybe is the only uh, country in the world where hydrogen cars uh, are already existed uh, like uh, usual cars. Uh, now, of course, the quantity uh, of these cars are, uh, are generally less than 1%. But it's increasing, and government has special uh, incentive uh, for uh, making people uh, buy these cars. Thank you, uh, Sergey. We are going to lose one you. second. Thank you, everyone. We're about to, to go off air, I think. Um, Phil, you. I would love to have heard from you as well on that question. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. I hope you got your questions answered from our panel. Thank you very much to the panel uh, for, for covering a wide range of topics. Uh, I'm sure if any of you have further questions, they'd love to get in touch with you. Thank you. Have a good rest of the conference. Bye for Thank now. You. Thank you all. Thank you all.